Okay, good afternoon everyone and uh, welcome to this third Thursday science webinar from the European Marine Board. Um, I think there's still a few people coming in, but I think we'll get started anyway and make the most of the time we've got. Um, so I'm Paula Kellett, I'm one of the science officers at the European Marine Board and I'm going to be moderating your session for today. Um, and this webinar series in general is something that we use as a way to showcase the science between behind um, the EMB publications and activities. Um, this one, particularly this month, is slightly different, but I'll, I'll go to that in a minute. First of all, um, I'd just like to go through some housekeeping rules. Um, so please make sure your name, name is clearly entered. So um, when we have the question and, and answer session that we know who's asking the questions. Um, if you do want to ask a question, um, you can use the Q&A function. You'll see that at the bottom of your screens. Um, and if you know which organisation and country you're from, it'd be great just to give us some context for the question. Um, and then the, the speakers will be asked um, the questions directly. So we'll, we'll use those in the Q&A. Um, if you need any technical support, please use the chat because this is only visible to the, the hosts and panellists. Um, and please note that this webinar is being recorded um, and is being made available both on our website and on, also on our YouTube channel. Um, so, of course, act accordingly. So, as I said, mostly these science webinars kind of discuss the science behind our publications and activities. Um, but this is ever so slightly different. So um, we also have a Young Ambassador program that I'm going to introduce shortly. Um, and in this episode, two of our outgoing ambassadors are going to, of course, talk about their science and their research, but also some very interesting lessons um, that they have learned from their time as ambassadors um, and some of the work they have done in sort of the science policy aspect. So we have one talk that's going to be on lessons and introspections from an ECOPS perspective um, and the other one on connecting research with marine policy and society. So really fascinating discussions and, and sort of bringing the wider context to their research. Um, so if you could have the next slide, I will indeed introduce our Young Ambassador Program. Um, so it was launched back in 2019 already. Um, and every year we take on two um, either PhDs or postdocs and they serve a two year term as ambassadors with us. Um, and sort of the main task that they do is to increase awareness and engagement from early career scientists in marine science policy issues. Um, but the ambassadors, of course, have been very enthusiastic and ambitious and have made it far more than that. Um, so they now have an EMB Early Career Ocean Professional Network um, for which they run various um, monthly activities, um, but also they're looking to run a large event um, in October. Um, and they also make sure that the voices of those early career ocean professionals are heard at EMB level. And the ambassadors are very engaged in the activities of the board and attend to the plenary meetings, etc. And um, so they're very good at kind of providing that two way uh, discussion. And um, they also help support our communications um, and can produce items, including blogs. And um, they represent EMB at events. And of course, they are rewarded for this activity. They're, they're provided with a grant um, and some budget for going to events and, and doing communications and so on. So I think it's Certainly for us, a very valuable program, and, and hopefully uh, it's the same for the people who, who take on being ambassadors as well. Um, so can I get the next slide? So let's get to the main part of this um, webinar. We have two speakers today. Um, I'll introduce them both now, and then I'll let them speak sort of back to back afterwards. Um, so our first speaker is um, Anjali Gopakuma. She is a Cochitel PhD student um, who was at the University of Bologna in Italy but is now at Mercuria University on, in Australia. So we're very grateful to her for joining us, despite the uh, somewhat uncomfortable timing. Um, and she, her work is focused on investigating ecosystem functions and services um, of restored salt marshes in urban seascapes. So linking both to Italy and to um, Australia. Um, and then if I already introduced the second speaker. So the second speaker is Dr. Rebecca Zichun. Um, she is a postdoc researcher at Geomar in Germany, um, but by some coincidence has also decided to move to Australia. So I think there's something of a theme going on here this week. Um, and her work is very much focusing on trace metal biogeochemistry, risk assessment of bioactive metals, um, and sort of very much also linked with sort of reaching out to wider um, society and public about some of the work she does. 
Um, so first of all, I'll hand over to Anjali and we can stop sharing our screen and we'll let you go ahead and uh, tell us all about your work and your lessons learned. Thank you so much, Paula. I will go ahead and share my screen. Um, all right. So, uh, hi, everyone. My name is Anjali Gopakumar. Um, uh, I'll be talking about my experience as an EMB Young Ambassador um, with the focus on the lessons and introspections from an ECOPS perspective. So to start off, I just like to give a, a brief introduction about myself. So I did my undergraduate uh, degree in biotechnology from VIT University in India, following which I worked as a program coordinator at um, a sea turtle conservation organization in India called Tree Foundation. And I think working here is where my love and interest for science communication came up because um, a lot of my roles as a program coordinator involved um, educating students and the general public on um, and on uh, several matters concerning environmental and marine awareness, organizing coastal cleanup programs, turtle walks, and all of that. And I think um, working there kind of um, made me realize the understated importance of science communication and how impactful it can be if wielded properly. And um, so following this, I did my um, master in the EU-funded Erasmus Mundus joint degree called the International Master of Science in Marine Biological Resources. And this led me all over Europe, um, in Spain, Italy, France, and Norway. And it also helped me meet a lot of like-minded scientists and helped me actually learn a lot more about science and policy specifically in the European landscape. And um, after my master, I am currently um, a Cototel PhD student in marine ecology, um, jointly working at University of Bologna in Italy and Macquarie University in Australia. Um, so the title of my PhD is Ecosystem Functions and Services of Resource Salt Marshes in Urban Seascapes. And I'm working under the supervision of Professors Laura Iroldi and Katie DeFore. Um, so the overall aim of my PhD is to look at the restoration outcomes at a microbial scale in coastal salt marsh ecosystems. And I'm currently in my last year of uh, my PhD. And um, so I'd like to take this opportunity to just give a very quick overview of the main objectives of my um, PhD so far. So um, coastal salt marsh ecosystems are actually, they have been degraded by human activities. And even though there are several restoration measures that, that are being undertaken, the potential benefits from this restoration, our knowledge about the potential benefits from restoration is quite limited. So my PhD focuses on four important ecosystem functions, and we um, are assessing if restoration actually has an impact uh, specifically with respect to these four ecosystem functions. So we're specifically focusing on one, uh, the first one, which is looking at the effect of restoration on the sediment microbial communities. So to do this, this particular part of my PhD was um, done in Italy, where we looked at changes in the microbial community structure and function between natural and restored salt marshes in Venice Lagoon. So we had three types of salt marshes here. We had natural, completely unaltered salt marsh. We had the restored salt marsh, which were salt marshes that were physically restored with structures to prevent erosion around their edges. And we had artificial salt marshes, which were salt marshes constructed artificially using sediment dredged from the lagoon. So just a quick um, show of the results that we found from this study, where we found that physically restored salt marshes um, actually improved the microbial diversity along the edge as opposed to natural and artificially constructed ones. Um, the second function that we focused on was to look at the effect of restoration on the benthic functional diversity. So this was also done in Venice Lagoon, where we decided to look at the changes in the benthic functional groups between these three types of um, salt marshes in Venice Lagoon. Our um, third um, objective was focused in Australia in the Hunter Estuary, where we decided to look at the effect of restoration on biogeochemical functioning. So for this, we actually used uh, microsensors in situ in the field, and we looked at changes in the biogeochemical fluxes, specifically um, oxygen consumption, sulfate reduction, and nitrous oxide emissions over different restoration stage periods, along with um, changes in microbial community structure. 
And our last objective was to look at the effect of restoration on the decomposition rates in salt marshes. And this was actually also quite interesting because we decided to conduct um, a six month study using tea bags where we decided to bury green tea and rooibos tea bags in natural and restored salt marshes and looked at how the decomposition rate varies along the months and how the microbial structure inside the tea bags vary as well. And um, so that was the first part of the presentation. And for the second part, I'll be focusing on the EMB Young ambassadorship that we've had um, for the past um, two years. So uh, we, um, I've been an EMB Young ambassador since 2021, along with Rebecca, and we're both now at the cusp of our two year uh, long role. And I am really incredibly grateful for all the experiences that I've had so far. And so some of our roles included uh, promoting and raising awareness about ocean science and marine policies to the general public. Um, we organized workshops and forums to engage and network with early career ocean professionals or ECOPS. We have had the opportunities to present science and policy related activities at universities and at our own personal um, lab group meetings. And we've also been able to write um, several blog articles on various topics. Um, related to ECOPS and other kinds of marine policies. I'd also like to now take you through um, some of the most exciting um, EMB activities we've had um, the, um, you know, the honor of uh, organizing over the past couple of years. So uh, one was this science communication workshop that we organized at SMRE, the International Conference for Young Marine Researchers. So we organized this along with our now EMB alumni, Alessandro, with Rebecca and our science officer, Paula. And it was a really great workshop because we decided to focus on um, the importance of science communication, specifically how to um, have an effective science, effective science, scientific communication. And we had five incredible speakers who spoke um, on a variety of topics ranging from the power of science illustration to in the importance of intercultural communication. And um, one of the conclusions that we came to at the end of the um, at the end of the workshop was that in order to be a productive and accomplished scientist, it, it's important to understand what our strengths are and to play to each of our strengths while also working together and co-creating with other um, actors from different fields, be it visual science, marine policy, et cetera. Um, we have also had the um, unique opportunity of participating in the video commemorating the Navigating the Future video series. And um, we were able to actually talk with a lot of other fantastic experts in the field of marine science and uh, talk about the role that Navigating the Future 5 um, series, Navigating the Future series in general, plays in highlighting knowledge gaps in the in ocean science and in providing recommendations for future ocean research. We also had the opportunity to participate in the 8th EMB Forum on supporting the ocean decade in Europe, um, along with Alessandro um, and um, Natalia. And it was a really interesting forum where we got to talk about the role of ECOPS in ocean decade and how important it is for us to develop our networks for the future, for instance. Um, EMB is also involved in several other activities, one of which includes uh, the Embracing the Ocean Artists in Residence program, where EMB provides um, grants to um, um, creative artists to work on their um, art along with other ocean scientists and talk about relevant marine research through their art. So I had the opportunity to interview a couple of artists from our previous edition, Lera Litvinova and Michael Beck, and um, talk about the art that they created and how they believe it would impact and how it has impacted um, the, the general public, for instance. And that was a really great opportunity. And um, now we come to the third part of my talk, which is where I have decided to focus on my experiences from managing multiple um, commitments as an ECOP doing a PhD. And I'm really hoping that this would be a little useful for any of the ECOPs tuning in right now. So um, one of the things that I think uh, was a difficult, was slightly difficult for me was finding my footing. So as mentioned previously, I'm a go to tell PhD student. And so I moved to Australia, <clears throat> sorry, I moved to Australia um, for the second half of my PhD. 
And um, the move itself came with its own set of challenges um, because I had to deal with a whole new university, new people, new administration, new rules, um, new study sites, new objectives and all of that. And not to mention the entire time difference that came along with the move because now we were uh, we had like a 10 hour time difference with Europe, which made things a lot more difficult. Um, so it was a little difficult to find my footing and settle down initially. Um, but I slowly learned that what actually helped me to kind of um, move forward was to just take a breath and to take care of myself first, because um, before feeling really guilty about all the other commitments that I was not able to fulfill. So I realized that uh, once I could um, focus on other things where I focused on meditation and yoga and reading a good book or um, focusing on hobbies like gardening or any of those other kinds of things, just cooking, eating a healthy meal. And I realized that that genuinely did help. And I think that's a very important thing to focus on, especially as ECOPS, because we have so much that we are already doing. Um, be it our PhD work, postdoc work, our research, and along with all the other commitments that we have, that sometimes I think we forget to take care of ourselves. And so I think that is quite important. And I've also had um, a lot of, um, along my introspective journey, I've kind of thought back about how, what I could have done to maybe um, change something or what I could have done better about it but to be honest I think with this particular part I don't think I could have done much differently but I think I could have probably been a little bit more accepting of myself and my limits <laughs> and um, another problem that I had was um, time management and this was a pretty big one because it was quite difficult for me to find the right balance between my PhD work and between my uh, EMB activities. And at the same time, I was also trying to find my um, place as a marine scientist, as a marine student. And so um, at a lot, a lot of the time, I felt like I was not able to manage my time well. And something that I learned um, was that a really important lesson was to actually prioritize. So I realized that knowing what was a priority and making sure to work on that at a given time period really helped. For instance, if I had field work coming up, I decided that I would only focus on field work and not think about all the other looming activities that are coming up. And that really helped me plan my entire schedule a lot better. And speaking of scheduling, another tool that I really thought was helpful was actually organizing things properly. And this might seem like a very small Thing, just having a daily planner, but be it on your phone, your laptop, or an actually actual physically printed copy, it was quite useful to just have every hour, um, just, just to have an idea of what you want to do every hour, because I feel like that helped me personally a lot. And I was able to schedule um, my entire PhD and EMB life a lot better with this. And thinking back on what I could have done to maybe done it what I could have done better about it I think um, something I could have done was to have a dedicated time for EMB emails so what happened was that um, because the emails used to come every day in the night I used to keep um, I used to just look at it when I had the time and then it got really overwhelming because you would just have like 40 emails just crammed together that I didn't have a chance to check over the last two weeks. And I think that really, that overwhelmed me as, and I started procrastinating. So I think actually dedicating time every week for emails that are not related to your PhD will give you time to focus on things unrelated to your PhD. And another thing that I think would help was to would have been to dedicate specific time and days for EMB focused work, which is what I've been doing recently. Um, so just for instance, having two hours set aside every week just to focus on EMB work, no matter how much you think your PhD might be bugging you, I think that would have really helped as well. And my another problem that I had was saying no, <laughs> because as we all know, it is really difficult to say no. And um, but I also felt like I inevitably had to say no because and I could not give my 100 percent to a lot of EMB activities, which made me feel really guilty. But I think um, I just kind of realized that at the end of the day, there's only so much I can do. And I think it's better to say no rather than overcome it and not follow through because that would have made me feel a lot worse. 
But again, thinking back about what I could have done to change it, I think, again, like mentioned before, to have a dedicated strict time for the EMB activities would have helped. To have a dedicated workspace would have helped because what happened was I ended up working from home during the weekends when it came to EMB work, and that was not productive for me. And I think I should have changed that part of it. And I think what also would have helped if was if I'd regularly tracked my progress, like how we track our PhD progress to make sure we're going, we have a strict um, schedule and we know where we're going. I should have probably done that with my EME work as well. And um, the last part, key takeaways from my EMB ambassadorship. So even though there were a couple of small challenges along the way, it's been a great journey so far. And if there are any takeaways that I would have, it would be to actually let you all know that it's really important to take every opportunity you have to communicate your science, because it's as important for you to be able to practice your communication skills and talk about your science to the world as, in, as it is for the world to hear about your science. And um, it's important to know all relevant policies for your science, because um, no matter what, we're all related be it policy makers, be it the society, be it scientists. So it's really important for you to know how your science will affect certain policies and how certain policies will affect your science. It's always important to have an idea about that. It is very important for ECOPS to know science communication tools, which Rebecca will talk about in a bit as well. And of course, um, the importance of networking and collaboration with peers, which believe me, is very, very important. And it's very helpful because it's it's encouraging and it's a supportive environment out there. And um, with that, I think we come to the end of my talk. I think I'd like to take this opportunity to thank um, the EMB Secretariat, Sheila, uh, Jana Brett, and especially Paula for all the support and assistance that she's given us throughout, for all the ECOPS and stakeholders that we've met, for the previous alumni, um, Alessandro and Natalia, and for the new um, EMB ambassadors, Alfredo and Juliet, and especially to Rebecca um, for all that she's helped with and for all that I've learned from her as well. And to all of you for listening. So, thank you. Thank you, Angelia. I think there were some really great messages for all of us. I, I think we could all uh, really pay attention to ourselves and uh, plan a bit better and, and definitely learn to say no. I, I feel like <laughs> that's a very key thing. Um, so I'm actually going to say if anyone's got any questions, please put them in the chat. But I think we'll do the whole question and answer together um, after both speakers have had a chance. Um, so I'm going to go straight to our second speaker. Um, so, Rebecca, the floor is yours. Yep. Um, so I'm just un I'm unmuted and you can see my screen, right? Awesome. So um, yeah, Anjali gave a really good introduction of the, the EMB and kind of nicely transferred into what I will be talking about today. And um, I will be talking about my, not so much about my science, but really about my experience um, during my time as an EMB ambassador, which was really valuable, um, which was a really valuable time for me, both personally and professionally. Because during these two years as an ambassador, I really had the time to reflect on and learn how I can make my, my science more impactful by really connecting it to, to policy and to society. And today I want to share just a couple of things I learned along the way with you. And I hope some of what I learned will be also um, of use to you. So today as a scientist, we constantly hear the slogan, the ocean we need for the future we want, right? Which is a great slogan. It's the slogan of the UN ocean decade. But I think as, as young scientists, we don't actually completely grasp what the slogan entails. Just because like Anjali said, we are so stuck in our signs um, that we don't look outward. And it's a really stressful time as a young scientist. So you don't actually realize what's going, out, what's going on out there. But what the slogan actually entails is that science, society, and um, governments have to work together to create the ocean we need and the future we want. So the we actually stands for all the three sections and no one alone can pull this major aim um, off. So, and I think that young scientists usually don't realize how important and how much power science actually has in this triangle here. So the knowledge we are producing as scientists and we are collecting is actually 
used by government governments for policy making the, the knowledge we, we have is valuable for our society to make informed and environmentally responsible choices um, such as when it comes to voting which which plays into the government part again and the values that the public holds are important again for policy making so it's really important that all these three um, corners of the triangle actually interact with each other and this interaction really decides upon which policies are put into place and where research funding goes to and therefore i think that young scientists really have to to start understanding this triangle and have to start interacting with these sectors a bit more in our activities because we want our science to be useful. We want our science to be impactful and we want to help educate and inform the society to drive change. So what can you do? What can you actually do as a young scientist to work a bit more closely with society and policy and to get from the ocean we have today, which is not really a nice one, to, to the ocean we want? And um, from my personal experience, there are three overarching things that we can do and work on. It's um, ocean literacy, it's science communication, and it's general engagement. And these three things are really interrelated and they're interconnected, but uh, you will see that in, in my further talk. So I'm just starting with ocean literacy, which I find personally really important. And it's defined as an understanding of the ocean's influence on us, and our influence on the ocean. And the exciting thing about the ocean is, as you all know, is that the science is virtually relevant to all of societal needs and for, for all policy making and governments, because it's important for the quality of life, for economic development, transport, resources, recreation, tourism, you name it, the ocean is important. Um, and hence you would imagine what the naivety of young scientists is that we think that all people and all stakeholders should know about the, the ocean issues and everything that we are currently facing and the dependence we have on the ocean, but it's actually not the case. The, the human impacts on marine ecosystems, as we all know, are largely not visible to most people, right? And therefore, um, the ish ocean issues haven't entered public awareness in the way we want it to be, at least not to the same extent as um, terrestrial degradation of the rainforest and, and whatnot on land. It has become better during the, the ocean decade, it has, but, but for example, a survey in 2022, so just last year in the UK about ocean literacy has shown that more than 50% um, of the people that, that were asked did not or did not know and never heard about eutrophication, very important for the oceans, have never heard about blue carbon and have never even heard about the decade, uh, the United Nations ocean decade, which is actually quite concerning, right? So our task as, as young scientists or scientists in general is to, to really help create an ocean literate society addressing the, the seven principles of ocean literacy that you can see on the right. And why do we want to do this? We want to do this because we want to educate our society to really understand the importance of the ocean to humankind. We want them to be able to communicate about the ocean in a meaningful manner so they can help us spread the word. We can't pull this off by ourselves. We need people to help us. And so that these people make really informed and responsible decisions, right? And that can then take direct action towards creating a healthy and sustainable ocean. So we really have to bring ocean literacy to all levels of society. So from schools to educate the next generation of scientists and policymakers, to, to the citizens that are voting for the next government. And we have to bring ocean literacy to the decision makers and entrepreneurs that, that change our society. Because as I said, when you look at the triangle, we, we need all these three corners to drive the change we need. So engaging, informing and educating becomes incredibly important for us as scientists. And I don't think young scientists actually realize this because like Anjali said, we just want to do our science. It's really important to get the papers out, but we don't realize how important it is to communicate about this and to educate about it. Um, and I think the quote on the, on the side fits it really well. I actually love this quote a lot because it highlights the importance of education in ocean literacy. It says, for in the end, we will only conserve what we love. We will only love what we understand and we will only understand what we are taught. So again, education is really important. And um, 
a couple of examples what you can do and what I do a lot in, in my research or started doing recently because I wanted to be more impactful and useful as a scientist too, because I enjoy that a bit more than just sitting in my lab and doing science is uh, we should start actually developing easy to understand resources and um, infographics to educate our community. We as ambassadors actually do that quite a lot in our outreach to, uh, to make our own infographics because people like to look at something visually uh, more than reading a text. That's just our, how our society is. And that's also where making and promoting in innovative ocean data visualization tools come into play because people just like to look at videos or play a game more than reading an article we're just not our society is not a reading society we like watching things so we really have to think about this when we want to make our science impactful what i started doing a lot as well as participating and facilitating events so i became a judge in science fairs at schools with an ocean teams the theme so trying to introduce the ocean in, in school levels i'm doing a lot of beach cleanups and i give talks about ocean sciences in environments where you usually don't hear about the ocean. So I go to fears and just stand on a on a um, stage and talk about the ocean, whereas all the other talks talk about something completely different. But I think it's, it's really important that we scientists start doing something um, that we feel really uncomfortable with. So to go out of our comf uh, comfort zone, because we want to reach people that usually have never heard about the ocean. We want to get these people and we want to educate them. And that means that we have to start working with people we usually have not worked with before or with sectors we have usually not worked before. And the EMB Embracing the Ocean Artists um, in Residence Program is a really awesome example of this because they're connecting ocean scientists with dancers, with artists, with musicians to really um, connect a wide range of our community with the ocean and raise awareness about ocean issues um, and, and benefits as well. And I think that's a, a really important program and there's actually another call out for the 2023 Embracing the Ocean Artist program, which you should actually check out. It, it's an awesome program. And a good resource um, to explore ocean literacy, if you want to know a bit more about it, is um, or anything and everything that's related to ocean literacy, you can find on this ocean literacy portal of the of the UNESCO. It really is awesome. It provides every resource and every content you can imagine about the ocean for every knowledge level, for every age level you can imagine, for every stakeholder you can imagine, and in different languages. This is in French, Portuguese, like every language you can imagine. So if you ever need a resource, you don't have to come up with it by yourself. It's freely available on this portal. Just click on it and download it. It's great. So definitely worth checking out. I use it a lot for my research. Um, that brings me to science communication. So to make ocean literacy work effectively and make people actually care about the ocean, one has to become a really good science communicator. And we forget that as scientists a lot um, because none of us has ever been trained in science communication. Me, myself, I had to learn it myself from scratch because it's not part of our curriculum as, as scientists as such. Um, and it's, uh, it's sad because it's really important to communicate in a meaningful and, and effective manner with stakeholders. So science communication is crucial. And I think young, young scientists should really get familiar with the principles of science communication and the concepts behind it. Because the hard reality is that while we constantly talk about outreach in science, I mean, we type it in our proposals, when we, uh, when we talk about projects, we always talk about outreach, outreach. But what we are actually doing is in reaching and that's really nicely presented by this lighthouse and that means we give talks and engage with people that are already in our bubble that already have a good idea of the ocean and its issues so we are constantly talking to like-minded people but what we actually want to do as scientists is outreaching we want to get the people that should know about the ocean and should care about the ocean but don't for whatever reason whatever reason that it may be and to do proper outreach to get the people that don't know about the ocean scientists have to completely change the way we talk about our research so it's not so much about data and graphs anymore and a new result and another new result and another new result it's more about storytelling I should have probably clicked the slides further. So it's more about storytelling. It's about um, telling a story that people can actually 
emotionally connect to because if people can emotionally connect to a story to what you say they remember the story and if they remember the story they're more likely to care about what you say they're more likely to think about it and to change their behavior accordingly um and to tell a good story oh sorry oh yeah here yeah. and to tell a good story and to make it easier for our audience to really retain what we said, because that's what we want. We want them to go home and remember what we said, right? One should really mm, keep in mind a couple of, of really simple rules. And it's nothing, it's common sense, really. It's nothing new. And it's really nicely presented in this infographic we made um, at the IC Mary in, in 2021. There you go, infographic and again, to make a concept uh, visually uh, nice. And it was about science communication, Anjali talked about this. And um, I think in my personal experience, even though it's simple and it's common sense, not a lot of scientists do it. So not a lot of scientists actually adapt their, their talk to the audience. I see a lot of scientists that talk and talk and talk and that you, you totally lose the, the people in the audience because they don't go down to the level, they don't realize what the knowledge level of, 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 of their audience are and then just lose them. And it's also really important to communicate science in a simple, concise, but still accurate manner. Also something scientists have difficulty to do. So usually they go over time and they just present one data slide, one table after another. But it, it's actually more important to give the audience a digestible amount of, of science in a really easy manner. And that's also where having a simple language comes into place and avoiding, uh, avoiding jargon. And doing that science communication workshop, we also realized that positive and uplifting messages are way more important than the doom and gloom of, um, I don't know, sea level rise and, and um, ocean acidification that we constantly talk about. Because the, the human mind, the human psychology only reacts to uplifting messages. So while it's true that there's doom and gloom, you can only get people to react to it when you tell them something positive. That's just how the human mind works. But that's good to keep in mind for, for your outreach and for your science communication. Also important is to stimulate curiosity by using examples and metaphors because it's they're easy easy to relate when it comes to the audience. They can visualize metaphors and examples better than if you just talk about um, statistics and data. And if possible, if it's at all possible for you, use a lot of visuals because again. The, the visuals are better retained than knowledge in written text. And you can do that by, by even implementing cartoons or use subtle humor to really drive the message home. So whatever works for you is fine. And like Anjali said, you don't have to do all of this by yourself. I usually, if, I, if, if I'm not in the mood to do graphics myself, I um, use the graphic designer at my institute and he's or he or she is doing the graphic designs for me. So you don't have to do it by yourself. Every institute has a dedicated graphic designer if it's big enough. So just reach out to them. Um, and if you want to know more about how to improve your science communication skills, I would suggest reading these two books. They're actually really great. The first one, Narrative of Everything, talks about the ABT framework. It's the end but the four framework, which is a really common science communication tool. So it tells scientists that we should use the end but therefore in our speech instead of end and end. And you realize scientists do that a lot. We say there's a result and there's another result and there's another result. And this is our conclusion without actually having a nice structure in, in our story. So the ABT framework will make your science a bit more interesting by helping you to answer the what. What is the goal of the group uh, that you are targeting it tries to answer the so what why should the people that are listening to you actually care about what you are just saying it tries to explain that now what what do you want them to do because people want to to be active they want to help so you have to tell them how they can help and then and it explains um or it answers the then what so what will be the next step once successful so people always want to have like a nice uh, fairy tale story so you have to tell them a positive next step that they can do and that that they can achieve. And from personal experience, I tell you, when I first did the ABT framework, I was like, mm, come on, that's just one of those, those concepts that doesn't work. I tell you, it does work. It does work incredibly like magic. I use it in my talks. I use it in proposal writing, in abstract writing, and it works like a treat. So you should actually try, try it out. It, it works really well. And finally, um, 
ocean literacy in science communication, what I just talked about, flows really nicely into our actual engagement. So for scientific knowledge and understanding to be impactful and to be taken up by policymakers and other stakeholders, we have to include them in, in our whole scientific process. So participatory approach is really crucial here. So we have to start co-designing and co-developing our research and projects with the relevant stakeholders from the get-go. And that way, we can start understanding each other better and understand what our requirements and needs are and understand that while policy is really fast moving, policymakers want to have data as soon as possible, science is really slow moving because we want to collect all the data to make really good and informed decision and that just takes a while. But this is what we have to learn from each other and we have to learn to speak the same language so that we can actually eventually, hopefully, find a common denominator and then drive change, right? And really important is also what we constantly or mostly overlook is um, when we include everyone in a project and have an open two-way dialogue, we create a feeling of ownership and trust, and, and especially the feeling of trust and ownership in projects are really important to, to be able to conduct purpose-driven and target-driven science because we know exactly what the other partner needs and what its requirements are so we can kind of design our science that way that it is impactful right um, and so that's what I do constantly in my research so while I'm not really working together with um, stakeholders themselves I work a lot with social scientists and with the humanities and with ocean governance scientists and with policy scientists to really design my, my science in a way that's it's impactful and useful for society and policy. Because again, I want my data to be used and I want my data to educate people. And what can you specifically do to engage better with, um, with policymakers? I think um, it is really important to be aware of the future science and policy needs and what is actually currently being discussed in both spheres. So, so what policy is, is really current and will be happening in the next couple of years. And that is where the EMB future science briefs and the policy briefs come in handy. You can find them on the EMB website and, and they're really valuable. And, and I would suggest for the more advanced researchers among us to actually use them in proposal writing and cite them because it's really helpful. And as you can see the future science briefs and the policy briefs, they're about various topics, about marine geohazards, about marine ecosystems, big data, citizen science. So you can find pretty much on every topic, you can find a policy brief or future science brief, which, which will be really helpful for your science. And what Paula kind of mentioned beforehand, we also do a lot of um, science policy webinars. So if you want to stay up to date on all the current topics that are currently being discussed in the poli science policy, marine science policy landscape, it's good to go to our monthly Thursday webinar. So next one is on the 20th of April. It's about enabling social sustainability through creative collaboration. It's a very nice topic. And uh, then we have our ECOP webinars every, uh, well, monthly, uh, the first Wednesday of every month. And the next one is about deep sea mining, which is also a very current topic at the moment. Um, and then if you want to be even more engaged and actively engaged in marine policy and the marine policy landscape, we, like Paula mentioned, we have the Euro Ocean coming up in October, and that's the biggest or biggest yeah, European Marine Science Policy conference, conference where you can actually get in contact and actively engage with all the policymakers and the stakeholders in the European landscape. So yeah, please keep that in mind. I have the QR codes on there if you want to know more information about this. And we also have an ECOP training before that conference also in Spain for ECOPs to really learn about science communication, how to communicate with policymakers and, and learn what the policy landscape actually looks like um, in case you are not aware of this already. Um, yeah, and just to drive the, the message home again, um, it helped me a lot instead of just do, sitting in the lab doing my data analysis to actually look at ocean literacy, to look at science communication and how I can engage with the different sectors. And I think it made me a way better scientist, a better scientist that I could have ever dreamed of. And it made my science so much more enjoyable. I can tell you, I just have so much more fun in my science since I worked with the EMB because I learned that there's a whole new world outside of my science that is incredibly um, awesome. 
Um, and you should, yeah, feel free to look into this and reach out. The EMB is great. Paula and, and Jana and Prit and everyone, Sheila, they're amazing people, amazingly knowledgeable. They're, they're, I learned a lot from them. So, And they're incredibly nice. You can always reach out to them and email them. So they are the emails. And um, yeah, if you ever have questions, reach out. Thank you very much, Rebecca. I, I don't think I could have put such a great advertisement together myself. It's been really great words and, and also really, again, really useful. I think, you know, all these comments that you've been made, you've made and all these lessons, they apply across science. It, you know, it's not just for early career researchers. I think this is something that really all of us need to be thinking about and being more aware of um, as we're doing our own work. And um, so I'm going to go to the question and answer discussion part. If anyone does have a question or a comment they would like to make to either of the speakers, please put it in the Q&A, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Um, and while you're thinking about that, I'm going to go back to our speakers because I obviously have tons of questions. Um, so actually, I'm going to go back to Anjali because I have to ask, tea bags? How, where, where, how does this come about? <laughs> <laughs> no, so so, um, so uh, we kind of decided that uh, we actually didn't think about the tea bags initially because it, it's not the first thought that you have that well oh all right that's a really simple experiment that you could have but then yeah we did um, meet a couple of um, researchers I so the first conference that I attended in Australia was in Cairns and I met a couple of really interesting um, researchers who, who do really cool work in wetlands and uh, one of them suggested that um, something that I could potentially look into was to use tea bags to look at the decomposition in the sediment and so when I started reading a lot more papers I realized that since I'm focusing on a microbial um, scale uh, level of work in salt marshes. It would be it would also be really interesting to look at changes in the microbial community structure over the months and see if they change similarly between natural and restored salt marshes. Because it's a very it's an interesting way of looking at it and hasn't really been done much. So so and we and it's cheap, it's affordable, it is easy science. So <laughs> I think that's how we decided to go about with it. And so we have like our last um, field work next month, which is a six month time period. And we're going to see how the decomposition happens over six months and how microbes change over six months between, and if they're different between natural and restored salt marshes. So I'm excited for that. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. And I mean, linking to what Rebecca said, I'm sure you can get a great story out of that as well. But I, the fact that yeah. you're putting tea bags <laughs> in salt marshes is going to be a, a great seller, I imagine. <laughs> I will tell you this, something interesting that we did actually see in the field is that in certain areas where there are a lot of crabs, they have actually gotten really bugged because of the tea bags in their homes. And they we've noticed them kind of getting like digging the tea bags out and tossing them out of their homes. <laughs> so I think that would be a great story eventually in the future. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think it's about it's kind of what Rebecca was saying, looking at your science in a different way. Um, and actually, Rebecca kind of linked to that. I wanted to ask, I mean, how has it been to do the, the sort of mind switch away from the way we're taught as scientists to think about things in a very factual, very straightforward um, logical way and then to go to this more emotional and story telling angle and maybe look at your science from a different different perspective I mean how have you found that uh, incredibly hard uh, because you might not notice or not a lot of people know that but I'm actually an introvert I, I don't like speaking that much um, um, and even though I come across as an extrovert I have, have a lot of issues with it so talking about science and data is is way more easy for me than talking about the emotional science and making a story out of it because also what 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 I'm struggling with is is the time commitment talking about data is really easy you just hammer in the figures you hammer in the table and tell tell what it means making a story out of it is really hard and time consuming um, but it's really more enjoyable because when I usually give science talks, you kind of see the people drifting away, at least the people that are not in your field, right? You just see them on their phones or on their, on their computer and they're not really listening. But when, you, when I started using that more interactive talking with storytelling, you see everyone listening and everyone nodding and kind of following your talk because they can emotionally connect to what you're saying. And it's way more enjoyable, way more. Oh, that's great to hear, actually. Yeah, 
but I can imagine it's it's not an easy thing to to do that initially. I guess it takes some practice. Um, so I see we have a question from Alexandra Han in um, in the chat, and that's to both of you actually. So she says, "What was the most? What was the EMB related project you enjoyed working on the most, and why was that?" So maybe I'll go to Anjali, and then I'll go to Rebecca. Uh, all right. Um, thank you for the question. I think the most um, fun that I've had, like the most interesting EMB activity I've worked on, was the Isimare workshop. Um, because I think that was one of the first workshops that we organized together and right from the get-go, from organizing it, um, deciding on who the speakers should be, um, just talking to them, getting everything organized and actually having the event, I just enjoyed the entire journey. I feel like I learned a lot throughout the entire journey, throughout the entire organizing process and I, and to be like Rebecca said, Science communication isn't something that's in our curriculum, you know, and the workshop, I feel like uh, we helped disseminate information and at the same time also take in a lot of information because a lot that was mentioned during the workshop was new to me as well. So I think that was the, that was the, that was the best one I worked on. Yeah. And Rebecca? Um. Yeah, I have to I have to answer that a bit more general because I, I'm really happy and proud of the ECOP network. Um, I think it will be, while it's in its early stages, I think it will be the, the most rewarding activity that we will be doing and it will be it will be there for a long, long time. And a lot of ECOPs will benefit from it and learn about the policy landscape because marine scientists nowadays, if you don't study specifically policy, you will never hear about it. And I think our network will, will bridge the gap between science and policy a lot, which I'm, I'm really happy and proud of. Thank you, that's, that's great to hear. And actually I have a question that kind of relates to that. Um, and because you were talking about all the sort of more education, providing resources, doing communications and all of those activities. And I guess that's kind of similar to reaching out to policy in the, in the sense that it's, it's more than just the, the standard science. Um, but do you think that's, kind of being recognized in, and supported in, in institutes? Or do you think there's still more to do to actually not just enable people to do it, but actually recognize that this is equally important to some of the other outputs? Um, it's a question to me, sorry. Um, yes, sorry, yeah. Uh, um, I think if, if you wanna apply for jobs, it's still the most important in, in the science realm, what, what you published, how many papers you published, what your citation is. But uh, it becomes more and more important the extracurricular stuff you're doing. And at Guillaume, especially, they're pretty much give me free hands. So they were so happy for me to go to the UN decade to have talks and different events. And I, I do a lot of capacity development and outreach, which has actually nothing to do with my with my work as a trace metal scientist. So most of the talks I'm giving at the moment are not about my research. They're about science communication. And as an early career scientist, how will you deal with everything? And I think they start to recognize that more and more. Um, they can do better, but especially the big institutes, they really, because it's also for the image right um if they if they can say that we are that we support our ecops and all these um activities it's, it's just good for the image and guillaume is doing a good job in that i'm glad to hear it yeah i think there is positive change coming then at least in in that sense um, so we have a question in the chat from Juliet, who's actually one of our other ambassadors, and she says, thank you so much to both of you. Um, I really loved your talks. Um, and what feedback do you usually get from ECOPs talking about your involvement in both communication policy, um, but also about the ambassadorship and kind of how do you talk about it? Um, she says she sometimes gets the impression that people are happy that someone else is doing that, but actually engaging for themselves is, is something that's a bit difficult for them. Um, and I'm going to go to Anjali, especially because you've had the experience of both in Europe, but also outside where perhaps EMB is completely unknown. So I wonder how that's been for you. I think that it, it's a very, it's, it's been interesting because what I've noticed is um, that I would have expected EMB to have a lot more um, um, impact in Italy when I was in Italy. But to be honest, there were a lot more people who were interested from Australia than Italy. 
um, anytime I would talk about EMB, about the work we do, or I show them and show them articles or talk about the videos that have been put up, the um, a lot of my colleagues in Australia were a lot more interested to hear more about it. And I, I I'm not sure why that's the case. I think it's just that maybe a lot of the people I've met here are a lot more involved in as e and um, or in, you know, um, just in, in these policy related matters and in science communication and all of that. I think that might be the reason why, because a lot of uh, my colleagues in Italy were more involved just with science. They're very, they were de very dedicated to their science, weren't as involved in science communication, for instance. And I think that that perhaps make it makes a difference. But I've also noticed that um, Twitter has been a really great space because every time I share something, there have been a lot of my old friends, old um, colleagues who ha haven't been in contact with much keep texting me and keep asking me about EMB. And I've had a lot of people who are really interested in the ambassadorship as well. So I think it just, you know, it, it depends on who's interested in science communication and who's not. And yeah. Oh, that's great. Is that something you've seen as well, Rebecca? Uh, yeah, I can just second what, what Anjali said. And I think, yeah, not a lot of people know about the EMB, which I'm really surprised um, about. And I think the issue is that there's, that there's just so much stuff out there. I mean, uh, there's so many networks and so many projects and so many programs that you can join, not just in, in Europe, but globally. And it's really hard for ECOPS to dig through that whole mess of things you can participate in and you can volunteer in. And um, I think ECOPS really struggle to find the thing uh, that is good for them and their interests and that benefits their research. So yeah, I get that question all the time for every uh, program and project I'm involved in. And I have no answer to this apart from there's just too much out there and ECOPS need guidance to dig through that. But what the guidance can be and how it should be done, I don't have an answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, that's definitely something I'd noted down for myself as well. It's, you know, the, there are so many things you can get involved in. And as Jali said, sometimes you have to say no to yourself because there's too many things that you want to do and, and you can't do. Um, and I, I was wondering, you know, is that internal pressure to, to engage or is that external or is that really dependent on on who you are and and what what you're interested in I don't know Anjali if that you know if, if doing all the extra activities so as well as your PhD you know was that something that it was something you wanted to do or was there other people saying oh you should really engage it's good for your CV and all this thing Oh, okay, okay. Oh, no, no, no. For, for me, it was personally because I wanted to um, engage and I wanted to learn more about it, be just kind of meet, uh, you know, other like-minded scientists or the like-minded science communicators, I think. So um, I think for me personally, it was my interest in um, learning more about the science policy landscape and being more involved in science communication that pushed me to uh, the EMB ambassadorship. Yeah. Yeah. And and Rebecca, for you, has it been again something you want to do, or is it really something other people encourage as well? Yeah, it's definitely more driven by me um, that I do all these extracurricular stuff. But um, I've seen more and more in the last two or three years that the hard reality is that you get better jobs if you do more extracurricular stuff. Because if you have a candidate that just does research and another candidate that does extracurricular stuff and research, you will take the one that does more stuff. And uh, that's just a hard reality. And um, so as sad as it is that we as scientists can't just focus on our research, um, yeah, you learn so much by doing the extracurricular stuff. So we should do them because it's important for society. Yeah, yeah, no, indeed. It's it's about, you know, what what are we actually trying to achieve as scientists and, and how can we best how can we best do that? And sometimes that is to make life more difficult for ourselves, I guess. Um, so that's been a really fascinating discussion, and I'm kind of upset we are getting to the end of our time already. Um, so I'm just going to get Britt to share our last slide. So as Rebecca already mentioned, um, this is a monthly webinar series. Um, and the next third Thursday Science webinar will be on the 20th of April. Um, and it will feature two of the artists in residence who have been working with us for a year now. So Michael Begg from the UK um, and Lyra Litvinova from Ukraine. Um, and they're both going to be talking about how they've been enabling sustainability through creative collaboration in their art projects. Um, so I think that's going to be a really fascinating discussion.
So uh, do look forward to seeing you all there and do make sure you register for that. Um, and otherwise, I'd just like to thank both of our speakers. Um, you've been great. It's been really interesting to sort of dive into what you've been up to and, and get some great insights and some great lessons for everybody, I think. So we shall definitely have to make sure we share those in a visual way somewhere. Um, and otherwise, yeah, thank you for everyone else who attended. Thanks for the um, people who asked some questions. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Cheers. <laughs>